Um, so working on sort of, it, sort of connected boat trades. Um, of the horses that we see in this part of the room, this corner here um, are the horses owned by St Nicholas of Wade. Um, and in fact, <laughs> a member of St Nicholas of Wade is here who could probably take some questions as well. Um, you'll see him on the film at the other end. Um, so right in the corner is Dobbin, um, who we also who we see from um, photographs um, taken in the early 20th century. So he's a 19th century hooded horse, or at least as far as we know, he's a 19th. We know he was performed in the 19th century, but again, we don't know exactly when he was made. Not for certain. Um, and in the early years of the 20th century, um, Percy Malham, um, who was a lawyer from Canterbury, he wrote the first book about the hooded horse, and for a long time, it was the, until very recently, it was the only book on the hooded horse. Um, there's a copy of that in the cabinet there. Um, and I think also he perhaps sparked a small kind of renaissance um, in the hooded horse as well, because there's a couple of hooded horses um, that seem to be copies of Dobbin. So in the corner there you see what the chiselet horse, the black one in the corner, looks like it's a copy of Dobbin. Um, as does, I think, um, this one which was um, in the Maidstone Museum collection. It was found in a barn in Wingham. And it was photographed, I think, around 1910 perhaps. Um, there's a photograph that was in the Malam family collection. Um, so the Malam family, so it may have been commissioned um, by Percy Malam himself. And we've blown it up on the wall there as well. So I managed to identify that the horse in this photograph is this horse here, yeah, that was found in the barn in Wingham in the 1950s. Um, and the, I identified it sort of partly from, it's got the same reins, the fabric I thought looked really similar, it's kind of thin dark fabric. Um, obviously it's had its, its ribbon, well it's had its um, rosettes changed I think, um, but the ribbons look very similar. Um, and the horse brass is very similar. But what really clinched it was its dental records. <laughs> it's, when you kind of blow the photo right up, and I managed to blow it up even more than that really high resolution version of it, you can see that the teeth are in exactly the same place. Um, it's a slight gap between the front teeth and one at the back. So that was it, that's the one. <laughs> um, the one next to it, is thought to be even older in fact. So this one perhaps was made as a copy of, of Dobbin and then the one next to it, is, was, maybe this was the original horse from, it may have been a Wingham team, who knows, we know that there was Hoodney in the Wingham area. Also next to these two guys from the Maidstone Museum collection are two from the Deal Museum collection. Uh, the one on the far end here um, was the 19th century one that was photographed um, by Malam's photographer and appears in, in um, his book um, in 1909, uh, so that's, that's a very old horse. Um, he was rediscovered in the 1950s, um, a man called um, Barnett Field, who you see in a photograph in the cabinet there, he was part of the 1950s revival um, of the Hood and Horse, um, but really as a kind of, he revived it as a summer tradition in Folkestone. So it came out of the, he was part of the, the kind of the International um, Folklore Festival in Folkestone. And he made this horse behind you there, the brown horse, um, was his creation. But he went to Deal looking for the Deal and Warmer horses. And he found this was the Warmer horse, which is in the, from the Deal Museum. Uh, he found it still at Warmer Court Farm. Um, I think it was in a barn there. Um, and then he went into the town after discovering the horse. He thought, I wonder if there's still any old hoodners about. So he went into the town looking for old hoodners and he found Jack Lamming, one of the old hoodners in the pub there. <laughs> and Jack Lamming got very excited about this. He hadn't hooded for a very long time. Um, and he built this horse next to it in the 1950s. Yeah? So that's Jack Lamming's horse. But Jack Lamming originally performed with this one and he's in one of the photos from... I can't remember, was it what, 1907, 1908, around that sort of time um, uh, in Walmart. Right, so that's the, those old horses. We've also got the instruments of the, um, of the North Deal Band, which were basically the same members, more or less, as the, the, the original Deal Hoodners. The Deal Hooden horse, although the Walmart horse survived, the Deal Hooden horse hasn't survived. 
but the current deal hoodness, um, we're a kind of revival team, and this is their horse and their um, their costume. Yeah, and you can still see they come out every Christmas um, in sort of de around deal and sandwich. Okay, what else have we got here? Oh, he's worth mentioning as well. While we're we're on the old tradition, so we mentioned Dobbin. Um, this beautiful creature um, is known as Satan. Um, for I mean, he's a little scary, isn't he? Um, see how the St Nicholas um, team um, who discovered him in um, an antique shop. It was in Canterbury, was it, or near Canterbury? Yeah. Um, discovered him. He was labelled by the the, um, uh, the sort of antique shop owner as a an Italian hat snatcher. But of course, um, <laughs> he was recognised as a hooded horse, and I think the the, um, uh, the owner actually sort of admitted that he'd pretty much made that up. I think he didn't really know where it was from. But <laughs> I think we could take a guess. So he's known as Satan. He's got a really heavy head. Um, the way he operates is slightly different from the others we've just looked at, where you've got the bottom of the jaw moves. But this one, it's the whole top of the head which moves to make the snapping noise. Very much like some of the things we'll see at the back of the room, the skull horses. So this one is made more like a skull horse in terms of construction. And there is one tantalising hint um, in one of the um, reports that Malum collected in his book. Um, one tantalising hint, someone said that they thought um, that the hoodening tradition was originally a skull horse tradition and then it was made into a wooden horse later. There's just that one suggestion of that, but I don't know, perhaps Satan is, is perhaps evidence of that because of the construction. Um, but also the fact that, I mean, it's a kind of logical thing to do because if you drop a skull, it will just shatter. But you drop a wooden thing like that and it will break your toe, but it won't hurt the horse. Um, made an interesting kind of discovery with Satan when I kind of got him upended it. I always like looking at the inside of things and seeing how they work. Um, when we got up inside him, um, there are two little pieces of metal either side of his eyes on the inside, which I quite enjoy. I thought, what on earth is that? That's quite puzzling. But then also, closer examination, I saw that the, the eyes had originally been hollowed out. They're bored holes that had been filled in at a later date. And going back to the reports in the Malum book, there was a report of one horse, which was the one at Hove, um, who was said to be incredibly scary because it had hollowed eyes, candles inside, so at night you'd see the kind of flames and smoke of the candles. Um, I took this into, um, I work at Canterbury Christchurch University and took it in and showed it to an archaeologist there who also had a look inside and went, oh that's soot in the top of the head. So I think, you know, if, it, if it's not that exact horse, old horse from Hove, um, it's a very similar one. So that seems to be pretty firm evidence. So I think the metal fixings inside were probably where you placed the candles. Um, why did they stop doing that and, and fill the, the eyes in instead? I mean, I could sort of imagine performing hood and horses myself. It's not going to be very comfortable with hot wax dripping on you as you're trying to perform. So it must have been quite uncomfortable, but pretty powerful stuff. So he's, he's quite a treasure, isn't he? <laughs> so that's Satan. Um, so we, if we kind of move round in this direction, so that's the kind of the tradition, so the house calling tradition, they go from um, sort of pub to pub, house to house, particularly to some of the big houses, asking for money. So kind of farm workers in the 19th century had a period of time um, where they really didn't have any work on the farms. But they did bring money in through, through the hoodening. It was actually quite a sort of profitable thing to be doing. <coughs> However, certainly Malum thought it was dying out in the early 20th century. It certainly hasn't died out at all. Um, certainly there's evidence. There were photographs of um, the St. Nicholas team in the 1920s. There were rumours that the Deal team was still going around in the 1930s. So it does seem to have been a reasonably continuous tradition that was interrupted by the two world wars. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we come round to the revival um, in the 19... Well, firstly, in the 1930s, um, we see a photograph here of uh, the Beckenham Morris dancers with a hooden horse. Um, 
but really it was in the 1950s that it's, there seems to be a lot of interest and I suppose renewed interest in folk culture generally and perhaps that was because of the Second World War that, that people felt that these kind of traditions were just more precious we needed to kind of protect them and revive them um, just sort of made us more appreciative of, of kind of the customs that we, we have in this country that largely are not known, largely are kind of, you know, sort of um, overlooked. So we have, um, this is uh, from the 1950s um, revival in Whitstable, um, Edward Coomber who made this horse. Notice it's a funny colour, different colour from the others, it's kind of greenish colour. Um, he's a greenish colour, but he was made, Coomber was actually quite well educated. Um, unlike the old Hoodners, who were kind of, you know, just farm workers and, you know, uneducated farm workers. And certainly, um, when one of them was kind of interviewed um, from the old St. Nicholas team, um, he thought it was terribly kind of, you know, sophisticated that the new St. Nicholas team were actually doing a play, um, rather than just kind of laughing about, which is what they seem to do. <laughs> um, so Edward Coomber, he'd studied folklore. And he was really interested in, in the Hood and Horse. He'd read um, about it in Malam's book. Um, it's green because that was the paint that they had in the store at the school in Whitstable. So it's like leftover paint from the wall. <laughs> so you've got, you've got a kind of almost like camouflage green, <laughs> green sort of colour. Um, so he performed him um, in the town, largely at Christmas time. And at one time, it ended up being stored. <coughs> Um, in a in a sort of shed near the near the sea at Whitstable, and it was picked up by the waves one very stormy um, day, and the whole shed went into um, into the sea. So he had to be recovered from the sea, and after that they, they attached the shells to him as a kind of memento of that, that moment. Um, I've mentioned the brown horse as well, part of the Folkestone revival, um, and of course there was a big I mean encouraged by Coomber's horse. Um, Mark Lawson um, came across, so this is Mark Lawson here, he founded the current Whitstable Hoodners, um, as well as the sort of Dead Horse um, Morris team, uh, that was one of the horses used by the Dead Horse Morris team behind me, looming over my shoulder. Um, he had come across Coomber's horse as a child, um, and it terrified the life out of him, and he sort of remembered that, so when he started making um, wooden horses, and he made several of them horses, um, there were kind of memories at first of, of his fright from the human horse. And this is one of the horses that he made. Um, and the other one you'll see has been performed um, earlier today, will be performed later on. So the Whitstable Hoodners are here today. Um, unfortunately, not with Mark Lawson, who's kind of very ill at the moment. Um, so, yeah, poor Mark. But the team continues. Um, if you have any kind of comments or, or memories about you'd like to write down. We've given him a horse bag, horse <laughs> feedback, and you can put your memories in the horse feedback and we'll pick them up later. Okay. Um, so other little bits and pieces. When we get to the kind of revival side, hooden horses started to be um, used from the 1950s onwards as summer festivals. They started appearing um, alongside Morris sides. Um, and I started performing the hooden horse, in fact this one, um, with Oyster Morris in Whitstable, uh, part of the May Day procession. And this one still comes out every May, except this year it won't be because it's here, I'm going to do it with another, another horse. Oyster Morris have now folded, unfortunately, but their, their bells are still here. Um, this is an interesting one as well, part of the sort of 1950s revival. Uh, the Birch, Birchington Towns Women's Guild were the first and, as far as I know, the only all-women's pudding team. Um, and these guys, the Broadstairs horses, um, who are made for the Broadstairs Folk Week, they are running around the town as we speak, in fact. I've just left them outside in the pedestrian zone. They're coming back at 2 o'clock. Go out at 2 o'clock, wander up and down Friendly Walk and the High Street, and there's a whole herd of them out there. They're causing um, mayhem, apparently. Sorry? <laughs> They're causing mayhem. They're causing utter mayhem, yes, they are. They're making and lots of children. Okay, don't worry, don't need to arrest.
guess. Um, before we move into the rest of the exhibition, any questions so far about the Hoodney tradition or the revival? Yes. Uh, I see you've got something about hobby horses here. I remember having yes. a child. I just thought it was something to pretend to be a well, to be a, a horse. Yeah. They, it's an interesting. It's a really interesting term, hobby horse. In fact, perhaps we'll turn to the, the this end of things here uh, to talk about hobby horses before we talk about anything else. So this term, hobby horse, is quite an old term. It goes back. It was used a lot in the Tudor period. Um, to describe, certainly to describe the kind of horse which you wear around your waist um, as if you are the rider. And some of those horses have false little feet that come out the side, you've seen that kind of thing. Um, uh, they certainly go back to the Tudor period and they were very popular alongside Morris teams at that time. But there's also, what we often refer to hobby horses as a child's hobby horse, which is just a head on a stick. Because wooden horses are heads on sticks. With, but you're covered with a hood, and I think, and there's been a few theories about why a hooded horse is called a hooded horse. I think the most likely is the fact that you are hidden under a hood. That's why it's you're hooded, you are hidden in that way. But all sorts of other things seem to have been called hobby horses as well. So largely it seems to refer to cho toys horses, those child's toy horses, and the ones you wear around your waist. But this is also described as a hobby horse. This is the hobby horse of uh, Simmonsbury. The Simmonsbury mummers in Dorset. And you'll see it's very much like a hooded horse. Very, very similar to a hooded horse. Although it doesn't have a snapping jaw, it is a head, it's got an extended neck on a stick, with the the performer is under sackcloth, like a lot of the traditional hooded horses. Also with sackcloth trousers though, which I haven't seen in Hoodney. Um, it's a really interesting, we've actually got um, the play on the, uh, the film, if you watch it, it kind of goes round for about 40 minutes or an hour, and eventually you get to, yeah, the thing that's on there at the moment is the Simmonsbury horse. There it is. So, in Simmonsbury, um, a tradition that was happening in the 19th century, we've got surviving plays from Sim Simmonsbury. There was a mumming Christmas play where you get St George battling the Turkish knight, one of them falls down, Doctor revives them. But at the end of the play, there's an extra kind of skit or an extra kind of play attached to the end where the horse comes on. With two characters, um, Jan and Bet, who are a kind of man and a female character. But Bet is, um, Bet is a man dressed as a woman. And these characters are very like the characters we see alongside hooden horses traditionally. So the hooden horse tradition, that house calling tradition that I mentioned. Oh, 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 here they are. I'll just. Uh, here, do you want to come, come in and uh, hear the talk? Here's trouble. Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we might pause for a moment. <laughs> yeah. There is a term, isn't there? Speak with the devil. <laughs>
But of course, if I'd done the exhibition during the Christmas period, I wouldn't have got all these horses, because some of them wouldn't be in use. Yeah, so some of them, so, so I wouldn't have been able to um, exhibit the St Nicholas horse probably that would have been in use um, through the whole run-up to Christmas, and some of the others as well. Um, these guys largely come out of the Broadstairs Folk Week, don't you? He was kind of satirised to some degree. Yeah. Um, is there a link between like Panto and yeah, that's good, good question. There's lots of like repeating characters in there, like yeah. um, the, the, Men, the man dressed as a woman yeah. and like the pantomime dame. I feel like that's definitely the horse as well. There's a like pantomime horse. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting thing. I've not found any substantial connections where this is definitely influencing that. The pantomime horse usually has four feet, whereas wooden horses, as you can see, have six. 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 Yeah, yeah. If you've been listening to the plays earlier, they can have any number of feet, but these guys have two. Don't they? Yeah. But this, this business, the man dressed as a woman, that kind of character, I think is a fascinating character. The Molly, or it's the Bet in, in the Dorset tradition. And you find this kind of character through a number of folk customs as well. So you find it in some mumming plays have this kind of character, some of the plough plays do. So it's like a something that, that is repeated. Um, and I think also the, the Molly... We go back to I turned Molly in sort of Tudor times. Um, it's it was a sort of well, where do we go? A bell to the audience actually, but but sort of often um, gender issues attached. There are gender issues to do with yeah, um, sort of boy prostitutes and things. It's that kind of realm that we're in. Boys. Yeah, the Molly boys. So there's all that kind of. And how much that feeds into Panto, I think, is a really interesting question. And I think it's, I think maybe there needs to be some more research there, actually. Um, because the Panto does draw on sort of popular culture from elsewhere, um, to some degree. So, yeah. Mm, okay, good food for thought. So, if we, so there's, there's some of those traditions. Have we kind of walked, we move, should we move in that direction? Into the corner there. Yeah, follow the, uh, follow the horses. Until eventually they were allowed into the house, and 
lo and behold, they caused havoc in the house and the uh, you know, horse would run around snapping and, you know, a very good exhibit. Right? <laughs> Excellent. So that's the Mary Lloyd, really popular now. It's all over Facebook every Christmas, the, the Mary Lloyd. Um, okay, and then also there's similar traditions in the north of the country. Um, so Cheshire, um, Yorkshire, um, and Derbyshire, those kind of those that, that sort of area, um, you get soul caking horses. This is a soul caking horse um, from the Cumberbatch Mummers. So we're looking at kind of Halloween time sort of tradition there. Um, also connected with something, you know, essentially a mummy play. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting example from the kind of old horse tradition in Yorkshire. Um, this would have been, I mean, it's the same construction really as this one. Um, and this one, I can, as I'm the curator, I'm the only person that's allowed to do this, uh, is to make his mouth snap. So like Satan that we just saw at the other end there, is the top half of the, uh, the mouth that snaps. Um, and you can see this one's got the handle on the back of it. So this one, in around, we think around 1880, um, the mumming team that took this horse around um, at Hooton Pagnell Hall, they were retiring as a team. So when they were retiring, it was their last performance, they threw the horse into the pond at Hooton Pagnell. And it stayed there for, I don't know, until some point in the 20th century, maybe 40, maybe 50 years, um, until the pond was dredged and up came um, the old horse that was still down there. So that must have been quite a wonderful, kind of almost ritualistic sort of moment we were all stopping and throwing the horse in. Um, but I gather it's very dark, and the, the dark, it seems to be, I, I don't think it's actually damaged from the water. It actually seems when you get inside and underneath, you can see um, paint strokes. So I think it was painted, perhaps like this one. Um, uh, it's got glass eyes, blown glass eyes. It's actually got wood in the front of the... Um, so you can really see how it's made. Um, in the front of the horse skull, it's had wood inserted and shaped, and there's a couple of screws holding that in place. So that's clearly the same kind of, <coughs> same kind of thing that's going on there. Do you know how heavy that one is? Because it looks pretty... It's fairly hefty. Yes, it is yeah. quite heavy. I have had to move it from one place to another. And, <laughs> You know, it was on my kitchen table before I could get into <laughs> yeah. Um But these things are quite heavy to perform. You notice the stick here with this one is quite a heavy thing, solid. I mean, see how um, energetic some of the horses are. Certain of the horses are really energetic. That one's not. That one is. Um, because actually they're much lighter weight. With these things, it's very hard to kind of operate. You really kind of step in like that with the foot. Um, so you can see that transition from, from skull horse to wooden horse does seem to be kind of a logical transition because the wooden ones are much easier to perform with. Um, and in fact there are some there are, there are some mention in the kind of uh, records of wooden horses as well as actually full kind of hide um, sort of horse, horse skins that people would wear in those traditions. Right, so that's the old horse tradition, and then over here we've got a Derby Tup. So the Derby Tup tradition, there are a few mumming groups that still perform with the Derby Tup and some Morris groups as well. But it was actually a much younger tradition, so um, in the 19th century, and actually right into the 20th century, um, up until at least even to the 1970s, Tups were taken around Derbyshire, Yorkshire border, that kind of area, by young lads between the ages of about 8 and 11. Yeah? So they go around the pubs asking for money, hopefully beer if they were lucky. Yeah? Um, and the performance, again, so it's like a house calling tradition like Pudding, and the tuck would get knocked on the nose by a butcher, um, quite kind of brutal, but I can imagine what fun for the, for the children that were doing it. And then sometimes the children that were performing the tuck, when they got to a certain age, they might then transfer to an old horse team, um, which would be, sometimes there would be like an older member that would, would kind of teach them the, the words and the songs, 
So these traditions have songs attached to them. There's variations of the Old Horse song, which is sung by Old Horse teams, and the Derby Tuck song, which you see a variation of it is on the, on the wall there. Okay, so obviously these, these things are very much connected with the kind of farming practices there, just as Swiftening seems to be connected with a lot of farming practices. And then over here we have something much less traditional. Um, so this is um, a project by Post Workers Theatre that I've been involved with. Um, and the idea is that it's kind of looking at precarious working practices. So precarious working practices in, in kind of modern, in the modern world. This particular project was based on um, an undercover journalist who went into an um, Amazon warehouse um, and just saw how awful the kind of the, the practices were there. Um, and the fact that at that time uh, people weren't, really weren't allowed to unionise um, in the Amazon warehouses. I think the first um, union has now happened in an Amazon warehouse. Um, and they felt, post workers of theatre felt that there was interesting parallels with things like the hoodening tradition and other mumming traditions, that they could kind of try and understand modern working practices um, in that way. So if we think about with the hoodening tradition, you know, it was a precarious kind of time that kind of, you know, instigated those kind of performances. Um, Amazon warehouse work is also, I mean, often, you know, seasonal work. It's all based around Christmas, you know. Suddenly they have an influx of, of workers at that time. But on a precarious, on zero hours contracts, um, and they have, I mean, it's quite difficult. Um, they have these things, so what I've made here is a version of a wooden horse, which is an Amazon warehouse scanner, hooden horse. So he's a kind of monstrous character in the auto hoodening play. Um, the Amazon, the scanners in the Amazon warehouses kind of will tell Amazon workers, kind of, you know, they've got to pick this stuff really quickly, they've got to get it from here to here really quickly, or they might have their pay docked. Um, it's really kind of, you know, so this thing kind of rules everything. Um, this, this scanner. We've also got a couple of giant SD cards for the scanner. So in the play, uh, one SD card gets taken out of the mouth and then a, then a kind of revolutionary one is put inside the mouth. We have a revolutionary figure here who is kind of the hero in the play that they developed. Um, Captain Swing, who if any of you have heard of the Swing Riots, so the Captain Swing was like a kind of fictional character, semi-fictional character in the Swing Riots, revolutionary figure. And it was often depicted covered in straw. So I took in um, inspiration, and they would set fire to agricultural machinery and things like that. Um, so I took inspiration, in fact, from Irish um, straw boys, that kind of thing. But instead of straw, it's electrical wire, which is quite heavy. But never, never mind. I don't have to perform that. I won't perform that one. Um, so he's the hero, and in his toolbox we go, well, how do you combat the kind of modern workplace and how you're kind of enslaved by people like the line manager here with his, um, with his laptop um, and his kind of corporate tie. Um, how, do you, how do you combat that sort of stuff? Well, actually, with things like, you know, infiltrating things with computer bugs. So these are all the computer bugs that come out of his, his toolbox, yeah? So auto hoodening, if you want to experience auto hoodening, I'll be here with Post Workers Theatre on the 29th of April doing that. Yeah? And they'll be, they made it also into a full length, like hour and a half opera with Infinite Opera in Birmingham. Totally bonkers. We're going to do a film screening of that on the 29th of April as well. So come back and hear Infinite Opera wailing. So that's a kind of new transformation of kind of hoodening, drawing on the hoodening tradition, drawing on other mumming traditions, and these kind of revolutionary kind of characters from our history. And we'll walk in this direction, and as we're passing, we see the black dog horse, um, and references to the Padstow Obios. I'm sure many of you know the Padstow Obios. Obios, obviously, is what the horse is. So these traditions, which are kind of taking us further away from Hoodney, I suppose, these are kind of predominantly May Day traditions. Um, but there is funny hints. I mean, in Cornwall, there was a thing um, called the pen glass in Cornwall. And none of the pen glass seem to have survived. And it's 
I mean, it's, it's roughly translated as a kind of grey horse, which is kind of roughly one of the ways you could translate um, Married Lloyd as well. So, it sounds like the pen glass may have been uh, a sort of head on a stick type tradition, but it hasn't been. What we have that does survive um, in the West Country is this this kind of hobby horse type thing. And if you're not familiar with the hobby horse or hobby horse tradition in, in the West Country, um, the big mask thing is the head of the rider, and the horse's head is this tiny, tiny little thing here. In fact, on the mine head tradition, there's a photograph of the mine head <coughs> tradition, the horse's head has almost just totally disappeared. It's just a mass of ribbons. Um, so interesting things which I think must have evolved from the hobby horses we were talking about earlier, that perhaps you wear around your waist, but here you wear them on your shoulders. Um, and they like to capture people under their skirts, particularly young women, and that's perhaps a lucky thing. <laughs> so there the West Coast we do. Sure. <laughs> uh, one of the West Country traditions is the Coombe Martin tradition, which we see painted by Ben Edge here. Um, and it has a hobby horse. It's a revival of a tradition that was happening in the 19th century with this strange character, the Earl of Rome, who was a fugitive, um, and he gets taken around the town. You see, if you watch the film for long enough, it comes up on the film, he gets shot and falls over, and then gets shot and falls over, and, a bit, and they throw an effigy of him into the sea. Really interesting kind of um, ritual shaming tradition. I think it's really fascinating. Um, they say, well, this seems a long way from Hoodney, but there's a tantalising report of a hood and horse being used in a shaming tradition in Chalock. And George Frampton uncovered that from a sort of an oral account. Um, that there was, you know, people in the village of Chalock who are perhaps being disapproved of for one reason or another. Maybe because it's an older man married to a young woman or maybe it was someone that was having an affair with someone else. You get these shaming traditions around the country um, where someone is kind of made an example of. And it seems this was happening with a hooden horse in Chalak, it seems, and that's really fascinating. But we have a shaming tradition here where the Earl of Rhone is put on the back of a don on a donkey backwards and ridden through a real on a real donkey backwards. Yeah? So I'm fascinated by these little hints of different traditions that sort of cohere. It's really interesting. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is the stacks. So, stag guys in. Um, so, although we don't know, you know, how far back the good <laughs> tradition goes, hello guys. <laughs> Although we don't know how far back the hooden horse tradition goes, there are actually constructions like a hooden horse that obviously are very old. If you look at the, there's a little fo um, photo from a manuscript here um, of a stag which is constructed, it seems, very much like a hooden horse. Yeah? So this is from the 14th century, although it's a Netherlandish sort of manuscript, it, was, um, sort of, it came over to this country very, very early. Um, so it's a stag's head on a stick like a hooden horse and you can see the person and if you get really up, up close you actually see the, the uh, performer's face peering through at the front. Really lovely. Um, so that's in the Bodleian um, Library in Oxford. Uh, and then we look at British traditions and we find, oh lo and behold, there is a surviving stag um, tradition um, at um, Adverts Bromley. <laughs> I've said too much and it's all sort of falling apart there. But uh, Abbots Bromley in Staffordshire, um, there are, s these, these antlers are darts, yeah? So there's a dance, but there's also, as you see so, from the photographs, there's, if you look up close, there's a hobby horse as part of this tradition, and the earliest reports of this in the Middle Ages, it's described as a hobby horse dance. Uh, we now refer to it as the Abbots Bromley horn dance, referring to the antlers. So we know it goes back to the Middle Ages, but actually, um, these are reindeer antlers. And there was carbon, um, uh, carbon dating of the reindeer antlers, which dated them to roughly sometime around the 11th century. 11th century. So these reindeer, this is a, a replica because... Uh, the Abbots Bromley ones, they won't actually allow them out of the parish. They have to stay in the parish church. 
But these were replicas that were made by someone in Abbots Bromley. Um, so very close replicas, very good re replicas. So 11th century, we think, well, where on earth did they come from? Well, we didn't have... French thought about them. Sorry? The French thought about them when they came over in the 11th century. Well, yeah. thought, this is really nuts. This is <laughs> crazy, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, I wonder, you know, we didn't have reindeer in this country. They were long extinct even in the 11th century. So it's likely that these reindeer antlers had come from Scandinavia. So you do wonder, is there a Viking connection here even? What's going on? Were they, were, at what point were they made into something like a dancing object or an animal disguise? At what point? We don't know. Was this even, did this even have a hood? As we see in this similar stag disguise in the 14th century. Who knows? We can't really answer these questions, but it is, I think, no. And you guys, can you answer these questions? No, not really. <laughs> But I say, I think it is really tantalising, um, and this lovely, I think there's a lovely connection in terms of the way these creatures, these performing objects are constructed, that they're constructed in the same way in the 14th century as in the 19th century, um, and in fact we find similar constructions still being performed stag disguises, like hood and stag, in Romania to this day, as a house calling custom. Any questions? I just want you to have a question. Not all at once, though. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if, you, if you think about yeah, Scandinavian possibility, yeah. Scandinavian countries can be almost Christianised. Yes. And those horns, which part, part of their ritual, might have been then put into the church as part of their surrender unto Christianity. Oh, that's a really interesting thing. And thought. then that church yeah. survives the Reformation. Yes. Whereas other churches were destroyed. Yeah, interesting. That set that rural church out of the way, yeah, probably, yeah. and not, mon not monastery didn't at all. Didn't get much attention. Didn't get much attention, so that's yeah. a possibility of why, they, why it survived. That's really it, interesting. You know? And where a lot of other, I mean, through the sort of early modern yeah. period, a lot of other sort of folk customs were yeah. being stamped yeah. out by yeah. Puritans. Yeah. Um, even Christmas, of course, <coughs> which is why perhaps yeah. in the mumming play, those that know the mumming plays, and Father Christmas, he says, am I welcome or am I not? And I think it was Ronald Hutton that suggested that, well, maybe that is because sometimes Christmas wasn't welcomed because of the Puritans. But they missed Abbots Bromley, didn't they? The Puritans. The tradition continued there and these things were kept in the church. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, incredible. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Marvellous. Well... I hope you've enjoyed it. Enjoy the rest of the day. These guys are going to be running about in the town a bit more. <coughs> unless it's raining really heavily and then you'll be running about more in here. Um, yeah, we'll see what the weather's like. How are you guys with rain? Anyway, I'll be hanging around if you have any other questions, um, anything that interests you. But also, I will remind you the performances that are happening. I get my glasses on and read my piece of paper when the performance is happening. So downstairs, you will see the Whitstable Hoodners will be performing again at 1.30. And then Dover Tales will be performing at 2.30 downstairs. Okay, and then you guys, well you can do whatever you want. I think I've got you guys scheduled for 2 o'clock in the town, but I'm going to your own devices. Marvellous. Thank you everyone. Thank you.